The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the chambers, let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is nigh above all the people. Good evening and welcome to another You in the Word. I'm Chaplain Kevin Santucci, and thank you for joining me this evening. Before we get into our message proper, I'd like to speak for a moment about mantle instability. Prior to the COVID-19, people were going about life as normal, and it was spoken of that if you keep these things before you, you will come out of COVID-19 well, that is, get plenty of rest, eat good food, and also go out into the open air, get sunshine, and exercise. To people who have actually put these things in place, believe it or not, friends, they are doing better than others who have not. But by this time, almost four months into this pandemic, and yes, some nations have not gone past uh, certain stages. They're still in the early stages, but some countries have gone beyond into um, stage four. And all due respect to that, we're dealing with sicknesses of which, or a virus, pardon me, that has taken the world. And if we're not careful, friends, or take care of ourselves, we can also be affected. My word to everyone this evening is, let's mind our mental health. Let's take time to uh, think about our families. But in order for us to take care of our families, friends, and think well of our families, we must take care of ourselves. And so I would encourage you this coming week, those who have not, take up some time to exercise. Those who have not, pull away from the junk food and start eating real food, live food. If you have not been sleeping in a room with ventilated uh, air coming through that's good quality air, then friends, I would encourage you to try to do this. And then, last but not least, if you haven't been out in the sun or spend too much time in the sun, I would encourage you to get some sun, at least 20 minutes of sun per day. Do yourself a favor. Save yourself problems in the future, friends. We need to save ourselves of what is called mental fallout or a mental fallout. And so I would encourage you to take time out for yourself, meditate with God, and most of all, friends, if you see someone who is in need, let them who are strong go out to bear the infirmities of those who are, who are weak. Not everyone's called to that particular calling of helping someone, but to whomever it is who is giving that special, special gift and uh, unction by God to do so, I would encourage you to do so. This leads us to our message this evening on the triumph. We are looking here at a message that speaks about triumphing or being triumph or triumphing over something. And this evening's message is entitled The Day of Triumph. On our weekly uh, Bible discussions, friends, I encourage you to join us. And so the same applies this evening. I encourage you to write your questions and share your thoughts with us this evening. If you have any thoughts of which you agree or even disagree with, then please share your thoughts. Let us work together. Let us move together. Let us grow in God together. That when he shall come, friends, we will be found worthy to enter into his joy. With that said, friends, we realize that there's quite a bit of critics that are taking 
uh, the world now and people are becoming more critical of one another. It seems like with more time, you have more time to reflect, but at the same time in token, friends, we have more time to do what? To also be critical of one another. And so, we must ask ourselves this question, why would we be in the spirit of critical or to be critical of someone in the first place? Does God give us the authority to be critical of our fellow man? Has he called you or I to be the judge of our fellow man? Well, I believe that God has an answer for us when it comes to us being critical. Now, we ought to be critical thinkers, but not be critical of one another. Now, it is said that they who are critical are persons who express an unfavorable opinion of something or somebody. They are detractors. They are considered as censors. They are considered as attackers or fault finders or backbiters. They are also known as revealers or belittlers. They are also known as nitpickers. These are all persons who of which we recognize as being critical. They love to be a critic to someone or something. They are commentators or observers. They can also be monitors. Friends, they feel that God has given them the authority to be critical. But the time has come. Be an encourager. The time has come for us to be an encourager. The world has plenty of critics already. Why would we dare to be a critic or desire to be critical of someone's doing or maybe their well-doing? The best that they have ever been able to do, we are still criticizing, criticizing their efforts. Last week on You and the Word, we looked at the return of Jesus Christ. If you remember last week, I said it will be the most joyous event to the saints living on earth, the second coming of Jesus Christ, because they shall be living during the most difficult time in earth's history. Based upon Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, Isaiah chapter 25, verses 8 to 9, they will say within their hearts, Lo, this is our God. When Jesus comes now, because they are waiting, they have been waiting for him, and he would save us. Yet it is during the day of triumph, which is the day of deliverance, those only who are holy, those only who have followed fully the meek pattern of Jesus. They will with joy exclaim as they behold him, Lo, this is our God. What a day of rejoicing that's going to be to those who have been preparing themselves to meet him. This is a day of triumph, friends. They wake, that's those who are in their graves. That's the saints who are sleeping now in their graves. They awake the call that is now summoned to them or given to them as a summons. Awake ye saints out of the dust of the earth, out of your dusty beds, clothed with glorious immortality, based upon 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 52. They are shouting victory at last. They're shouting victory over death. They're shouting victory over the grave. These changed saints are caught up together with the living saints, as we mentioned last week, together to meet the Lord in the air. Never are they to be pulled back to this cursed earth again, friends. But together they go up to meet the Lord, caught up together in the air to meet Him, never more to be separated from their friends, never more to be separated from their loved ones. Never more to be separated from God. And to his faithful followers, 
Christ has been a daily companion and a familiar friend to them. They have lived in close contrast. The communion with God they have been able to enjoy. And upon them the glory of the Lord has risen. And we see here that in them the light of the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ has been reflected. Now they re rejoice in the undeemed rays of the brightness and the glory of the King in His majesty. They are prepared for the communion of heaven, for they have heaven in their heart. You can find that in a wonderful book called Sons and Daughters of God, page 30. But can you imagine anticipating, waiting for something, and finally it happens? Victory. You, you have waited for a long time, and now victory has come at last. You are happy, you are joyous, you are joyful, just to know that all of the things that you have gone through, the curses of life, and all of its uh, 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 finest points of greatest disaster that has come upon you, you have overcome. On the other hand, friends, the finest points of victory, you can also claim that it was all through God that you have been an overcomer. Through Christ, you have been able to overcome all things. What a day of rejoicing that's going to be, friends. Just to recall or reflect upon the moment of which God had given you victory. It's not something that's like to be looked at, friends. It is a major something which we need to contemplate on this evening. When soccer teams, as it was there, Liverpool just the other day, hit that final whistle, they knew based upon their work that they had put in the entire year of the European soccer, they knew, I'm saying European, but the English soccer, they knew that they were now victorious. It was not the victory that they were anticipating. Yes, earlier in their days of their competition, but 30 years had now lapsed, and they had now become victorious. A time of excitement was now in the air. To some, they were not so much excited because it wasn't their, their team which had won. But at the same time, friends, you cannot deny one who actually able to say, we are victorious. We have accomplished something in life. Oh, friends, this past school year, many children be in primary school, be in middle school, be in, 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 in high school, college, university, they have overcome the challenges of their educational uh, 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 year. And they have come forth victorious. We have seen a unique thing take place this year like we have never seen in the entire world. People going across the stage, but with no one there. No family, sorry, just their family before them. But it's not a huge crowd that's there before them, friends. But at the same time, you or I cannot deny them victory. Victory, friends, they have enjoyed. And we ought to be celebrating them. What do you say? We ought to take time to reflect upon the time of celebration with them. It's good to celebrate. The Bible encourages us, friends that we ought to continuously celebrate one another. And I encourage you, friends, to do the same. We ought to take time to celebrate. Celebration is excited, friends. It is an, an exciting moment of life. You have watched that wonderful lady, that wonderful friend, that wonderful wife of yours go through the nine months of carrying that child. And then you are now in the room of delivery. The baby now has come. And it's a moment of excitement. You're not a smoker, but you're around giving out uh, uh, things of which you had never in your life dreamed to be giving out. At the same time, friends, you're saying to yourself, Wow, this is a moment of excitement. You see, friends, 
We ought to take time to celebrate. We don't celebrate enough. We don't celebrate with each other enough. Families, we don't take time out to recognize the goodness of God through our celebrations. But it is important for us to celebrate. Just the other day, puppies were born to a wonderful friend. She saw her dog, of which she had brought home, and now the puppies had now just been uh, uh, born. What a day of celebration that was. I remember when the first whale was actually born in captivity. What a day of, that's a killer whale now, but what a day of excitement, a day of victory that was. Friends, there's so much for us to give thanks for. There's so much for us to celebrate. It would do, do well for us to take out more time than what we are doing to celebrate. As we consider celebration, friends, we need to celebrate our nation. We need to celebrate our countries more. We take time out to celebrate others, but we don't take our time to celebrate our own. It would be well of us, friends, to this week, just duck down a few thoughts on how you're going to celebrate your country. Don't wait for a special time, but you're going to celebrate because it is more important to celebrate than to be critical. It's so easy to be critical of our leaders. It's so easy to be critical of our country. It is so easy to be critical of our neighbors. It is so easy to be critical of our job. It is so easy to be critical of our families at times. But oh friends, we don't spend enough time to celebrate. And I would encourage you friends to take out time this week to celebrate. This is why so many children leave home. They leave home because they are not celebrated. It's not because the home is not providing everything that they need, friends. It is. But it's just, just that we're not celebrating one another enough. It is amazing that when we leave our places of which we consider as a place of haven, and we look out to other places, and we celebrate them more than our places of haven. Oh, friends, it is time for us to take out more time to celebrate. We ought to take our time to celebrate. But with that in view, friends, triumph is something of which God encourages us that we ought to do. We ought to take our time to triumph and to celebrate. With that in view, friends, I would encourage you to turn with me in your Bibles. For the Bible says that God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. This was an act of celebration. With anticipation to celebrate. John chapter 3 and verse, celeb and verse 17. When God sent his son into the world, friends, he sent his son on a mission to finally celebrate or a moment of triumph. And God is looking for that moment, friends. He cannot wait. He's anticipating, longing for the time when he shall celebrate humanity. What a day of rejoicing that's going to be when we take our time to celebrate and see the goodness of God shining through the light of redemption. You see, my friends, it is not the style of clothes one wears that makes us celebrate, neither the kind of automobile one drives that causes us to celebrate them, nor the amount of money uh, one has in the bank that comes and causes us to celebrate. We recognize that there are many rich people within this world, friends, but they're some of the most miserable people. They are miserable and they are most critical. It's unbelieving. There's sufficient in the world for all. But at the same time, friends, because we have not learned what, with what little we have or how much we have to celebrate we have become selfish within the context of living. These things mean nothing, friends. It is simply service that measures success. George Washington Carver stated, However difficult 
life may seem, there is always something you can do, something I can do, and success it brings, friends. The greatest signs of success for a teacher this year was not all that you put into the work. It is to be, that is, the children's guardians, the children's uh, uh, light, the children's example. What sort of example have you been to the children this year? Oh, friends, I would encourage you to take a time to celebrate. And it's through the eyes of this we can celebrate. What will, will be the song of the redeemed when they finally enter home, friends? They would sing a song of triumph, a song of celebration, because they have gone through something. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 26, verses 1 to 2. Again, we are looking at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 26, verses 1 to 2. And again, we are looking here at the context here of celebrating. Context of moment of triumph. And if you have gone through something, friends, you ought and you have succeeded through whatever you have gone through, you ought to celebrate. Isaiah 26, verses 1 to 2. And it reads, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that keep, sorry, open the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. What a song. You know, friends, it is this song here that only the redeemed of the earth shall sing. It is this song, friends, that shall ring out through the corridors of heaven, which the angels, they shall fold their wings. It is this song, friends, which the unfalling worlds, when they hear the saints of the living God, they shall look with amazement, because they have known and seen these men and women who have been wretched, who have been wicked, who have been conniving, who have been jealous of one another, and try to pull down one another, had become saints now of the living God. Oh friends, what a day of rejoicing that's going to be. That which will make the character lovely in the home, is that which will make it lovely in heaven, friends. And if we manifest the character of God, of Christ, here on earth, keeping all the commandments of God, we shall be cheered and blessed with glimpses of the pleasant home in the mansions soon to be. Jesus has gone to prepare for those that love him. Soon the saints will sing a, a new song before the throne of God. A song which no man can learn save the 144,000. Yes, the innumerable number of saints of God, they shall sing also. But there's a song, friends, that the 144,000, they shall sing. It is a song of Moses and of the Lamb, a song of de deliverance. None but the 144,000 can learn that song, for it is the song of their experience while here on earth, an experience such as no other company have ever had. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth, friends. These have been translated from earth, from among the living, and are counted as the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Revelation chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. Revelation chapter 15, verses 14 and 15. And so we see here, friends, that God has a people who shall stand on that day. Let's turn to that passage of Scripture in the book of Revelation, and let's read it for ourselves, as we shall behold and see those whom shall overcome 
and shall be overcomers. Again, we are turning to, Re to Revelation chapter, chapter 15. For whatever reason, these pages are not running either with me. Revelation chapter 15, and here we go. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harp of harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God. And the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the trumpet and after that and I behold and lo and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open let's turn now to verses 15 and I'm sorry here that's in I'm saying verse 15 but that's chapter 14 chapter 14 verses 1 to 5 and please forgive me I'm just looking here at my at my mind and asking God to help me as we move together. Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 to 5. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand heaven, his Father's name written in their foreheads. These are the saints of the living God, friends, who have gone through the time of Jacob's trouble. They have experienced a great, great tribulation. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These saints of the living God, friends, verse 4 says, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, when, talk about, when the Bible talks about women here, it's not physical women. It's talking about adulterous or uh, uh, apostate churches. Systems, friends, which have now gone counter to the will of God. We'll come to that another time. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were re re redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth were found no guile, for they, the Bible says, are without fault before the throne of the living God. Friends, what a time of rejoicing that's going to be. When the saints of the living God, friends, are given the opportunity to be ushered in to the great to the great city of God. These are they, friends, that have gone through great tribulations. They have passed through the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. They have endured the anguish, the anguish of the time of Jacob's trouble. They have stood without an intercessor through the final outpouring of God's judgment upon the earth, called the seven last plagues. But they were not hurt during that time. But they have been delivered. For they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Their robes have been made white. And in their mouths were found no guile, the Bible says, for they are without fault before God. They have learned how to communicate with God and with men. And on this point, it is said, the greatest problem on earth right now is communication. Communication is the illusion 
that has taken place. In other words, our success in this world and the world to come hinges on our interaction and our clarity in communication with one another and with God. But many of us, friends, we don't fully understand the importance of communication. We take it for granted that people know what we're doing and understand what's in our mind, but they don't understand, friends, we must communicate. In vice versa, friends, we take it for granted that God understands, yes, He does understand everything, but the problem lies in that we are not communicating with Him. And although He misses His time with you, and although He desires a little time with you, but friends, we don't even give Him that. We must hunger and thirst for righteousness, the Bible says. We must seek His face continuously. They are the children of God, the Bible says. Therefore, the Bible says, are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night. They serve Him in the temple, friends. This is the 144,000. And He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. And they have seen the earth wasted with famine and pestilence. The sun have scorched the earth, have scorched men with heat, and they themselves have endured the suffering, the hunger. They have endured the thirst. These are the 144,000 who have gone through the time of Jacob's trouble. They have now come through victorious. But they have hungered no more. They shall hunger no more, friends. The day will come, friends, when God shall give them more than what they even ask or even imagine. What a time that's going to be. No more suffering. No more pain. No more heat. No more bad talking. No more violence. No more killing. No more murder. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them Himself, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14 to 17, and Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. And as the redeemed look back over the ages, they will see that the Savior, He has chosen them, He has educated them, He has discipled them, in the school of trials. And as they look back upon these trials, they would say that these trials are nothing but dung in comparison to the joy that God has prepared for them that love Him. Oh friends, what a time that's going to be when we look back upon all of these things that we have gone through. They would see that they have walked in narrow paths on earth, but God has let them. The songwriter was right, friends. Jesus led me all the way. It is true, friends. We must understand the leading and the direction of God in our lives. They would see that they were purified in the furnace of affliction. For Jesus' sake, they endured opposition. For Jesus' sake, they had endured hatred. For Jesus' sake, they had endured calamity. They followed Him through conflict sore. They endured self-denial and experienced bitter disappointment, not just by the natural, but yes, by many themselves, friends. People had promised and their promises were broken. But their own painful experience, by their own painful experience, they learned the evil of sin. They learn the evil of sin and its power. They learn its guilt. They were also learners in the school of God and they looked upon it with abhorrence. And as a sense of, inf uh, of, of infinite sacrifice made sure through Christ, they humbled their hearts before God 
And they say, thank you, Lord. They accept his sacrifice with great appreciation, friends. When was the last time you just stopped for a moment and meditated upon the goodness of God? Read there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. When was the last time you took out to just meditate on the closing scenes of the life of Christ? What manner of love, friends? All I can say, what manner of love and they love much because they have been through much. Having been partakers of Christ's suffering, they are now fitted to be partakers with Him in His glory. Oh friends, I want to be there in that day. I'd like to say good evening to you, Dave, and a blessed evening to your family as well, and to those who have joined us on You in the Word. Thank you very much for joining us. And if you would like to uh, share any thoughts in our discussion this evening as we're looking here at the triumph, a day of triumph, please join in with us this evening on you and the word. And by human tribunal, they were considered de and they were de de declared. They were also condemned as the vilest criminals upon earth. Oh, friends, you can't get no worse than that just for living the life of a faithful saint of God. Living a life unto God, you will one day be considered and condemned. You will be considered as the most vilest criminal upon earth. It doesn't sound right, does it? But at the same time in Tokyo, when Jesus said to his disciples that in three days, and I shall rise from the dead also. They didn't fully understand that neither. He also said that he must go to the cross. He must die for us. They didn't understand that. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away. Isaiah 25 verse 8. This is your trials and your tribulations. God said that he shall take them away. Let's move now to the book of Isaiah chapter 62 verse 12. For the Word of God helps us to see that they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. Friends, those chosen persons, chosen saints of God, they're called the holy people. Not just saints, they're called the holy people because God is holy. And if God is dwelling within your life, you are also holy. He has appointed to them, unto them, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of peace for the spirit of heaviness. Isaiah 61 and verse 3. And they are no longer feeble, friends. They are no longer afflicted. These saints of God are no longer scattered. They are no longer oppressed by the enemy, Satan himself, and all of his evil angels with those who have associated themselves with him from of earth. Henceforth, they are to be with God. They are to stand before the throne of God. Oh, friends, but as they stand now, they're standing in the rich robes of Christ's righteousness. Most honored, and they are now standing before the throne of the living God. They are crowned with diadems more glorious than any queen or king has ever worn on planet earth. Now I know that the Queen of England has a beautiful, beautiful crown. I know that Emperor Haile Selassie and many of the kings, they have worn beautiful, beautiful crowns, but friends, the crown that God shall place upon the redeemed of the earth. O oh, friends, the diadem shall be even more greater, more beautiful. And the day of pain and weeping are forever ended. Yes, friends, it is on this day that God now, he welcomes his children home. And the king of glory shall wipe the tears from all faces. Every cause of grief have been removed. Every cause of grief, not just grief has been moved, but the very cause leading to grief has been moved. 
And so we see here, friends, that God shall wipe all things from their face, from their mind. Amid the wave and the waving of palm branches, they pour forth a song of praise. Clear, sweet, harmonious. Every voice takes up the strain. Sopranos, altos, tenors, baritones, bass, and everyone sings according to the part that's been gifted to them from God. Some of you saying this evening, well, chaplain, I can't sing. Don't worry about that, friends. On that great glorious day, friends, we're going to all sing. And we shall all sing until the anthem sways through the heavenly courts. Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto, and unto the Lamb. And all the inhabitants of the earth respond in the ascription, Amen, Amen. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God. Forever and ever. Revelation chapter 7 verses 10 to 12. And so this evening, friends, God's appeal to you is a straightforward appeal. Appeal to the heart, friends, and that is, we have only begun to understand the wonderful theme of re redemption. With our finite comprehension, we may consider most earnestly the shame and the, the glory that Jesus had gone through, the life and the death, the justice and the mercy that met at the cross. It was at the cross, friends, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burdens of my soul were, were, rust, were washed away. It was there by faith. Oh, friends, by faith I beheld the light. The light of the Son of God shining forth from the cross. Yet with the utmost stretch of our mental powers, we may fail to grasp its full significance. The length and the breadth the depth and the height of redemption. Dimly we look through the glass, but soon, friends, face to face shall we see our Lord. The plan of, re re of redemption will not be fully understood until that day. And even in that day, friends, we would learn through the ceaseless cycles of each eternity the plan of salvation. What a day that's going to be. Christ has made every prov provision for you. He has made every provision for me that his church shall be transformed, illuminated, lit up in this demonic world. That his church, friends, will be shining forth as a glorious, glorious place of safety for those seeking eternal life. He desires that we shall, re, re, shall reveal His own glory in our lives. Friends, what a privilege is ours this evening to be able to reveal the goodness of God shining through our lives. The indwelling of the Spirit will be sown in the life only upon those who accept it. Oh, friends, may God allow you to be transformed. May you will to be transformed, that He may will to transform you as He desires to. The Son of Righteousness this evening has come with healing in His wings. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. So from every true disciple, from everyone listening in this evening, friends, God says to you, be of good courage. I have overcome the world. There's no need to feel helpless. There's no need for you to feel weary, friends. I have come with true healing in my wings for you. The, re the religion of Christ means more than just forgiveness. It means more than just forgiveness of sins. It means taking away our sins. John chapter 1, verse 29, when Jesus was seen coming 
unto John in the river. John shouted out to him, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And after the sin is removed, God through the Holy Spirit fills the vacuum with His glory, friends, with His grace. And the religion of Christ means divine illumination, rejoicing in God. It means a heart emptied of self and blessed with the abiding presence of God. When Christ reigns in the soul, there is purity. There is freedom from sin. The glory, the fullness, the completeness of the gospel plan is filled in the life. When God dwells within a man's heart, friends, the acceptance of the Savior brings a glow of perfect peace, perfect love, perfect assurance based upon Psalms 119 verses 165 to 176, friends. Peace. O oh, great peace have they which love thy Lord, and nothing shall offend them. In Psalms 106, 100, uh, 119, verse 166, it says, The Lord, the Lord, Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation, and done thy commandments. Let's read on. My soul hath kept thy testimony, and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies, for all my ways are before thee. Let my cry come before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Listen to David now as he pleads to God, and this is our prayer as well. Lest my cry come near before thee. O Lord, give me understanding according to thy word. Let my supplication come before thee. Deliver me according to thy word. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. Oh, friends, many of us ought to just be taught. That's all we need this evening is to be taught. This is why you and the word has been, has been created to help us understand simplistically the word of God, friends. The word of God is clear. Read on in the Word of God, it says, Psalms 119, verses 172 and onward. It says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteous. Thy, sorry, it says, Let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. I have longed for thy salvation, O, o Lord, and thy Lord is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee, and let thy judgments help me. Listen to David, friends. He closes up by saying, I have gone astray. We have all gone astray, friends. Like a lost sheep, we have all been like lost sheep, friends. Seek thy salvation, for I do not forget thy commandments. David helps us to understand, friends, that we are all, we are all on the chopping board. But God, through His redemption, friends, has sent salvation. And despite our waywardness in life, despite us going away from the will of God, despite us not listening to our parents, despite us not listening to the law of the land, friends, God says He would bring you to your senses if you will. The beauty and fragrance of the character of Christ re revealed in, in the life testifies that God has indeed sent His Son. Friends, when God makes a transformation in our lives, the world beholds it and they say, what a change, what a change. Many years ago, I was here visiting my old neighborhood. And as I was visiting my old neighborhood, I was there giving invitations during that time to a special meeting that was going on. And as I knocked on the door of this particular person, the individual came out, I'm not calling them by name, but as they came out, the person looked at me and said, Kevin, is that you? I said, yes, Mrs. Such and Such. 
And they said, What a change has come over you. You look completely different. I remember the days when you were blank, 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 blank. But now look at you. Your features are different, and even the way how you speak is different. Oh, friends, if God can change a wretched person like me, friends, how much more can he do for you? You are far better than I am. I'm, what, as Paul stated, the worst of the worst. But at the same time, friends, God is able to transform us. If he's able to transform us, friends, he can do mighty work, a mighty work for anyone who comes to God through Christ Jesus, friends. And this evening, he speaks to your heart. Christ does not bid his followers strive to shine. He says, let your light shine. Let us read it in the word of God, friends. It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, verse 16. And if you have received the grace of God, the light is in you. You are not the light. The light is in you. God is the light that shines through you. And this evening, God wants to, wants to re remove obstacles. He wants to re remove pain. He wants to remove anything that separates you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Arise this evening, friends. Shine, Jerusalem, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Psalms, sorry, Isaiah 60 and verse 1. The light will shine forth to penetrate and dispel the darkness that's within and the darkness that is without. Oh, friends, you cannot help shining within the range of your influence. Don't matter. It doesn't matter where you go. You will shine, friends. It's not you that's shining, but God that's shining through you. As we close this evening, friends, bring, bear in mind, bear in mind that the revelation of his own glory in the form of humanity will bring heaven so near to men and women, boys and girls, that the beauty adorning the inner temple of you will be seen in every soul of whom you come in contact with, friends, because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Men will be captivated by the glory of an abiding Christ in your life. Men will be stunned. They'll be taken back, friends, because they see something in you, a change. This evening, friends, God wants to make a change in your life. He wants to redeem your life. And to those who go out to meet the bridegroom on that great day, friends, they will go out because they have made a change earlier in life. And this evening, God is saying to us, you can make the same change in your life. If you are feeling down and need hope, you can turn to God this evening. He says, I'm, I am here. If you need to commit yourself to the Lord this evening or recommit yourself to the Lord this evening, He says, I'm standing here waiting for you. The Lord does not desire that His people should give away and be given away through the spirit of discouragement. God has come to you this evening, friends, with a message of encouragement. He stands at the door waiting for you, waiting to come into your heart this evening. Why not let him in? Why not let him into your heart this, this evening, friends? He stands waiting to receive you. He loves you, friends, and he's longing to redeem you. He wants you to be a part with him in that great glorious day when the kingdom of this world shall become the kingdom of our Christ. Oh, friends, it is on this day God will say to you, Welcome home, my children. Until that day, friends, God says to you, Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee. Brother, server, you go, and he... That's God now. Say it. I will not fail thee. I will not forsake thee. It is time for the saints 
to ever realize the glorious truth found in God, friends, that He's with you even to the time of the end. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Knowing this, how can he be discouraged? How can the saint of the living God be discouraged this evening? And finally, the Apostle Paul, in his exhortation to the church of the living God, states, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 he says to you, be strong. Be strong in the Lord. Friends, you have heard a message this evening, a message of encouragement. A message that helps us to see that there is coming a day when great triumph shall be given to the saints of the living God. They shall enter in through, into, through the gates into the holy city. Oh friends, if you want to be in that city, if you want to be in that time of triumph, I encourage you to pray with me this evening that we will be able to stand and ever done all to stand, friends, having our loins geared about with truth. Prepare to stand in the great day when Jesus shall come. If this is your desire to stand and to be triumph and live triumphantly from this day forth in the Lord, pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we realize that in Thee, we can become all things. But of ourselves, Lord, we are weak vassals. We are destined to fall. There is nothing good inside of us, Father. We are so weak that we cannot even think for ourselves at times. Yet alone, we cannot help ourselves. And when we think of good, Lord, evil is present continuously. We ask, O oh Father, that you would give us help. You would give us strength. You would send aid from the throne room this evening to make us conquerors. Now, Father, there are some this evening who are saying within their heart, I want to give my heart back to you. There are some, Lord, who have walked with you and they're saying, I want to come back home. And yet there are some listening to your voice, this, listening to my voice this evening, who are saying, I have never accepted this God before. The God that keeps His children. The, the, this same God that protects His children. This same God that shall keep water and bread before His children during a time of great trial and tribulation. But at the same time, I've never ever met a God who is able to promise such triumph for His children in the days to come. Oh, Father, I accept you as my Savior. If you're that person, pray with me. Father, I accept you as my Savior this evening. Please forgive me of my sin and come into my heart. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you've prayed with me this evening and you've, and you've given your heart to the Lord, I encourage you to find some pastor, find some church of which teaches and preaches the word of the living God, friends who upholds the entire word of the living God. And if you don't have a church, friends, and you would like to know more, then why not write me and we can at least be able to, to converse one with another until you find a church or a place where you can worship God. It is my prayer that God would keep you till we meet again. Until next time, friends, I invite you to join me on You and the Word as we shall look next week at another subject that shall bring us closer to heaven. Until next time, I encourage you to be faithful. Be faithful to yourself. Be faithful to your family. But most of all, friends, be faithful to your God. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and grant to you his peace. I'm Chaplain Kevin Santucci. Have a wonderful evening with a mighty God. God bless. <laughs>